Luke chapter 9. But he was telling me that he was focused on discipleship. And of course, as I think about discipleship, the main message I remember from Jesus is, take up your cross and follow me. You know, that whole point that when we're serving the Lord, sometimes it gets a little dirty and it gets a little hard, but we're called to follow him in all things. And so I was thinking about how, how does that fit here with a mountaintop experience of the transfiguration because he shared and he said, well, this is kind of where we're going next. This is what the next lesson. And so I was thinking, well, you know, when you're paying the cost of discipleship, sometimes you're suffering through some difficulties. Well, it's hard to deny ourselves, isn't it? Not only do we have this flesh driving us, but the world is working behind it too to drive us to be selfish. It does come down mainly to selfishness, I would think. Well, I wonder, especially when you're in the struggles of life, how often have you wanted a mountaintop experience, a spiritual mountaintop experience. Well, we all, I'm sure, are fairly familiar with the transfiguration story already, so we know this is going to be a mountaintop, and we know this is going to be an experience. Let me share with you, back when I was a teenager, when I'm supposed to say I guess I was young and stupid, I used to go backpacking. Now, I already lived in the woods. I was raised in the woods. But I, as a teenager, would go originally with my family and then later with other friends. And we would go up into the mountains, sometimes the Trinity Alps area, um, up out of the uh, area of Bernie, which was close to where I was raised. And we'd go up into the mountains. We'd go up to this high mountain lake. There's a mountain, and then the lake was kind of like in the crater of this mountain. And we'd, we'd go up there for about a week, backpacking, fishing. You're familiar with brook trout? I think that high mountain brook trout is some of the best tasting fish you can get. It was a wonderful time up there, but there was a highlight to this. It was not enough to be up at the crater of the lake. I needed to get to the top of that mountain. Because, you know, we're always wondering what's on the other side. And every time... Every time during that week, that highlight would be to go to the top of that mountain. So we would climb up to that mountain. It sometimes take hours to get up there. And once you finally peeked over the edge of that mountain, sometimes you'd see some of the most beautiful sights. A lot of times it was more mountains and more water and more creeks. Sometimes if you, could, if you got in the right spot, you could actually see down into the valley and start seeing. But it was a beautiful sight. Well worth all the effort. But we couldn't stay up there for long. You had to get back down to camp before it got dark. The last thing you want to do is try to be crawling off of a mountain in the dark. But that was the highlight of the backpacking trip. Well, <clears throat> Jesus has taken three disciples up a mountain. And this is going to be a highlight for them. Something that they will be able to use once the resurrection once the Holy Spirit had come upon them, they could use this as an encouragement to God's people to say, you know what, I know you're in some struggling times right now, but I've got good news, good news. Glory is coming. Glory is coming. And I saw it with my own eyes, so these three could say. Let's look at the text. If you have a Bible and you want to open it, or if you just want to listen to me read, I can do that. It's out of Luke chapter 9, and I'm going to be reading verses... 28 through 36. Some eight days after these sayings, he took along Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah 
who appearing in glory were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep, but when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not realizing what he was saying. While he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and reported to no one in those days any of the things which they had seen. As Luke records, eight days after Jesus had been instructing the disciples about his coming death, burial, and resurrection, he took three disciples to a mountaintop. I want to look at this experience. I want to evaluate this experience. I want, well, I don't know about you, but I want this experience to be with Jesus in his glory. Father, just bless as we look into your word now. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to begin with the fact of the transfiguration. Only Luke tells us that Jesus went up the mountain to pray. In fact, Luke often tells us about Jesus going up mountains or getting alone to pray. Luke is a great encouragement to us about, hey, we need a good prayer life. And so Luke tells us they're going up this mountain to pray, but while praying, he is transfigured. Now, Luke doesn't use the word transfigure. Speculation here by scholars is that he probably didn't want to... Um, encouraged the Greek-minded philosophies of the, the gods of the Greeks and their transfigurations, you know, stuff like that. Matthew and Mark, however, make it very clear. This is a transfiguration. And what do we mean by transfiguration? Well, for one thing, as Luke describes, his face changed. The appearance of his face changed. Can I just say, it glowed. Not just his face, his clothing glowed bright white. Bright white, that leukos in the Greek is a bright white. And in fact, it is actually described not just as bright white, but like flashes of lightning. Of course, we're all familiar with the thunderstorms, right? We don't like them very much because that sometimes means fire. But the bright flash of light for a moment blinds you. Well, this is how Jesus is described. I believe that Jesus actually reassumed the glory, the appearance of glory, that he had had prior to his incarnation. Prior to Jesus becoming a man, prior to Jesus as a baby in Bethlehem, he had spent eternity past as God, God the Son. What was his appearance? Glorious, glorious appearance. Here is Jesus assuming, reassuming this glory that had always been his, prior to the incarnation, with his face and his body shining, his garments glowing, this brilliant white. It's hard to imagine. Luke even has to try to describe it as comparing to lightning and comparing to the whitest of white. I believe it was Matthew or Mark that speaks of it as being as whiter than snow. A brilliant, brilliant, bright light. Not only is Jesus seen, but there's two with them, Moses and Elias, or Moses and Elijah, as we would say it. They're with Jesus on the mountain in glory, in glorified form. I mean, think about it. Moses had been dead a long time ago. Elijah, he went up in a fiery chariot. And here they are with Jesus on the mount. One thing we learn right there immediately is Hey, when we're with the Lord, we're not just disembodied spirits floating around. We have a glorified body. But even more so, you have to wonder why. Why is Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus on the mountain? And even more specifically, and even more importantly, what are they talking about? Well, we do get some information here to consider. 
I think, first off, a good reason that there'd be Moses and Elijah with Jesus on this mountain, as well as these three disciples, who we're going to find in a minute, we're not quite there yet. Both Moses and Elijah had unusual exits from the world. Elijah, we already mentioned, how'd he go up in a fiery chariot? Moses, well, we do know he died. We do know that God buried him on Mount Nebo. That's the end of Deuteronomy, the last chapter of Deuteronomy, I think it's 30, 34. And Jude actually says something very strange about what happened there too. But the point is, is nobody knows where Moses was buried. God took care of that one. So both had unusual deaths, shall we say. Another good reason that there be both a Moses and Elijah with Jesus on the mountain is, well, with Israel, they would be witnesses that would be trusted. In fact, prophecy had been declaring that come the end, Moses and Elijah are going to be on the show. But I also think there's another good reason. Moses and Elijah represent the two great divisions of the Old Testament, that being the law and the prophets. What was it that the law and the prophets were primarily about? Bringing salvation to people. Moses, often through the law and through the sacrificial system, you can see there's a need for salvation. The prophets are constantly pointing to God and the need for salvation. So I think there's a good reason why these two are up on the mountain with him in glorified form, recognizing the fact that they'd been dead a long time ago. But there's also something else that's significant. What are they talking to Jesus about? My translation uses the word, his departure to come, or to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. I actually like the Greek a little bit better, because the word for departure in Greek is exodon, where we get our word exodus. And now what do you think about exodus? What name comes up with exodus? Moses. What are we talking about? What is what are these two talking to Jesus about? Jesus is going to die. Fulfilling the law and the prophets, bringing us salvation. They're with him on the mountain talking about that fulfillment that for thousands and thousands of years they've been waiting for. But why? I believe that this was an encouragement for Jesus. Now, Jesus is a hard one to kind of define. I mean, think about it. How can you be 100% God and 100% man? I got my doctorate in theology, and guess what? I haven't figured that one out yet. But you know what? I've studied the other doctors of theology, and they don't have it figured out either. None of us has that one figured out. We can work on a 50-50 concept, but not 100-100. You're either 100% one thing or 100% Jesus is all God and all man. You, guess what? You don't have to figure it out, but you do have to believe it. But what am I saying here? In his humanity, the thought of carrying your and my sin on him, on the cross, must have been crushing, devastating. You and I have a hard time really understanding this because we have a sin nature, and it often influences our choices and decisions. It is what mars our conscience and our, con our conception of things. Jesus was perfectly sinless, Hebrews 4.15. He was tempted in all points, as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was perfectly sinless. All his life, not one sin. Again, that just blows your mind, doesn't it? But on that cross, he was a condemned sinner. Condemned because of my sin, because of your sin. That must have just totally thrown him for a loop in his humanity, okay? I hate to separate deity and humanity, but boy, I can imagine that this must have been quite an encouragement. Moses and Elijah up on the mountain with him saying, we got this, Lord. You got this. I can imagine Moses and Elijah with Jesus. Think about it. Ever since Moses and Elijah had been and gone on to heaven, 
they were probably just rejoicing and glorifying with Jesus before his incarnation. What a great time they had probably had together prior to Jesus' incarnation. But in all of this, and considering what a benefit this might have been for Jesus, you know who the main audience was? Three disciples. Three disciples. So here is Jesus, transfigured on the mountain. And it's almost a sad fact to note that the disciples kind of missed the opening of this event. However, I want us to focus on these three disciples for a minute. Again, we know that they are Peter, James, and John. And they get to go up to the mountain with Jesus. This is, these were one of the, the only other one was Andrew that was part of this inner circle, the closest group to Jesus, the ones that Jesus gave the best, most instructions to. I mean, this was the group that um, when Jesus went in to raise Jairus' daughter from the dead, these were the ones that got to go with him for that. So these were the closest disciples to Jesus. And they get to go up on the mountain. Why would Jesus think it necessary for these three disciples to receive this mountaintop experience? Well, Jesus had already been telling them that he was about to die. He was going to a cross, and he was going to die. But when they looked at Jesus, they were looking at the Messiah that they had always dreamed about, the one that would come and conquer Rome, the one that would become and make them the most powerful nation on earth. They weren't looking for a dead Messiah. They were looking for a reigning Messiah. And they couldn't get this through. Jesus couldn't seem to get this through their heads. But he was starting now to tell them, to warn them over and over and over again. We read in the Gospels how God, Jesus was warning the disciples, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to die. I am going to, three days later, rise again. And they couldn't ever seem to get it. And so Jesus takes him up on a mountain. Right after one of his first times, he declared that fact to them. Because there's a tragedy coming. In their lives, Jesus was going to die. They were going to watch it. They were going to see it. They were going to be devastated by it. But the good news, this experience, can encourage them and motivate them in those troubling times. Preparing them for glory ahead. Well, how is this going to work? Well, first off, <clears throat> like I mentioned, um, where do we find the disciples? Ah, snoozing away. It seems like this happens a lot. I don't know about you. I, I have a way that all I got to do is sit down and I can go to sleep sometimes. Here's the disciples asleep on a mountain, almost missing the biggest event of their lives. Now, I mean, it was probably quite a walk up this mountain. We don't know exactly which mountain. There's three different possibilities. Um, most cases, probably was up to a six-hour journey to get up to the mountaintop. And once there, it could have been evening time. And hey, they were exhausted. They're just human beings. And they almost missed this opportunity. But something wakes them. And we don't know what it was. But we do know <clears throat> that the word it says here that speaks in the text of... Uh, um, They've been overcome in sleep, but when they were fully awake, something got them awake. Maybe it was a shock. Maybe all of a sudden a noise, but all of a sudden, here they are, and boom, there is glory in front of them. All of a sudden, they look up, and what they see is heaven on earth. Because where Jesus is glorified, it's heaven, folks. What an amazing picture is in front of them. They're seeing Moses and Elijah. And I can imagine that probably the only reason why they would have known it was Moses and Elijah because they must have overheard the conversation, which is why we get to have it in our Bible. What an amazing picture. What do you do with a picture like that? You and I have probably had some mountaintop experiences, spiritual experiences in our lives where we just felt the Lord just flowing through us, filling us. What do you do? Most of us, I think, would probably kick back and say, wow, and just and enjoy the experience. <clears throat> but maybe you're like Peter. I love Peter. He has what I call hoof and mouth disease. 
Even if he doesn't know what to say, he's got to say something. I mean, our text says he didn't know what he was saying. Well, he's got to say something. Jesus, glorified, Moses, uh, I, I, Elijah, all this. Got to do something about this. I mean, maybe Peter even has the mindset that, um, that we've got to keep this going. We can't stop this. He mentions, let's build three booths. One for you, Jesus. One for you, Moses. One for you, Eli Elijah. Booths. It might have been a picture of the Feast of Tabernacles. You see the booth on the screen there. Maybe that was happening at this time. It could well have been a good the season for the Feast of Tabernacles to be occurring in Jerusalem. And Peter's saying, let's build three booths here on the mountain so everybody can come up and see glory. See God glorified here up on the mountain. I think the New American Commentary gives a great explanation of what might have been a little bit off on this state besides the fact that Peter tends to take in not just his foot, but his sandal and probably up to his ankle. <laughs> Let me quote, clearly Peter's suggestion was out of order. But what exactly was wrong with it? Was Peter wrong for suggesting that this experience should be prolonged? The previous statement about Moses and Elijah leaving gives some support to this view. A better explanation, however, is that Peter erred in equating Jesus with Moses and Elijah. They were not equals. The voice from heaven explains Peter's error. In contrast to Moses and Elijah, who were God's servants, Jesus is God's son, the chosen one. He is unique. He cannot be classed with anyone else, even two of God's greatest servants. He is not only greater, but other. It is hard not to see in the voice from heaven, at least a hint of an ontological Christology in which Jesus' essential nature is sharply distinguished from that of Moses and Elijah. Or to summarize, you can't put Moses and Elijah in the same category as Jesus. But I think there was more here too. Dr. MacArthur in his commentary, I believe, gives us a good explanation of this when he says, Peter's brash suggestion shows astounding self-confidence. He was out of his element. The normal world of time and space and in the supernatural realm of the divine. Yet he did not hesitate to offer suggestions to the Lord about what should be done. He was still trying to divert Jesus from his suffering and towards setting up his reign at that time. Although well meant and offered humbly, Peter's suggestion was off target. You see, you'll remember the situation where Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Remember what Peter said? You are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said, the Father has revealed that to you. Remember? Great statements being made there. But right after that, all of a sudden, Jesus tells him, now, I'm going to go, and I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die, and I'm going to raise again on three days. And remember what Peter did one time? He said, far be it. No, Lord, you're not going to do that. And Jesus said something quite amazing, quite astounding. Remember? Get thee behind me, Satan. Peter, Jesus responded. This was not God's will that Peter was speaking at that point. That's what he wanted. Delay the cross. In fact, better yet, don't even go there. I mean, Jesus could have accepted the temptation offered by the devil, remember? And he could have taken on, he could have had all the kingdoms of the world because the devil says he has control of them. Mm. He, Jesus didn't need to go to the cross. If Jesus goes to the cross, now we could be saved. But if Jesus could be swayed, could be changed, so he didn't go to the cross, then you're going to hell. Because that's the only option to heaven through Jesus and his death on the cross. Peter, again, is thinking, I want to see Jesus in power as the king of kings. I want to see him conquer these doggone Romans. I want to see Israel in that glorious position as prophesied over all the world. There's a problem here, Peter. 
Not even you are going to get into that kingdom unless you're saved. Salvation needs to be settled first. So I think there's a couple things going on here, but I think the big thing here, what I want us to think about this morning is, Peter wanted this experience to never end. And don't you? I mean, when you can be close to the Lord, isn't that the best place to be? Lord, don't let it end. We want to be here forever. He didn't know what he was saying. The three disciples were blessed with this mountaintop experience. But you know, these mountaintop experiences only last a short time. And they have purpose to encourage the disciple to continue living for Jesus in expectation of the coming glory. In the end, they're not going to be able to talk much about this until after the resurrection, until after the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. But what an opportunity. What a blessing for God to give us these type of experiences. But they're so short-term. We want them to last forever. But we're not there yet. Right now, we have a cross to bear. Right now, we're called to serve the Lord. Well, so we've seen Jesus transfigured. And basically, the quick definition of Jesus' transfiguration is, at that moment of time, heaven came to earth. Jesus in glorified form. There's nothing less than heaven on earth. For these three disciples, all of a sudden, it's like they're outside of space and time because there's glory in front of them. Something that just totally amazed them. Dumbfounded them, except for Peter. You know, again, you can't dumbfound Peter. He's got to say something. But then we have a divine response. We read in the text that suddenly God the Father shows up. Oh, and this is typical fashion for, for God. Whenever you see God coming in the Old Testament, or remember when Jesus um, uh, ascended into heaven, there's always a cloud involved, right? The cloud of God's, what we call the His Shekinah glory, as we borrow a Hebrew word here. The Shekinah glory of God. He shows up in typical fashion, in a glowing cloud. I tried to get bright clouds, but that's as good as I could get. As we compare the gospel accounts of the transfiguration, Matthew, for example, tells us that when they entered into this cloud, the disciples, let's put it this way, they fell on their faces. They hit the deck, folks. They were in the presence of the Father, and it scared them to death. And then God spoke. God spoke three times. The Father, three times in Jesus' life. Do you remember those three times? The first time was at Jesus' baptism. The one person who definitely knew what the Father said at Jesus' baptism besides Jesus himself, John the Baptist, because it helped identify Jesus as his Messiah to him. You wonder, how many other people heard it and understood? This is the second time, the transfiguration. Here, there's only three disciples present to hear. The last time occurs right prior to his death on the cross. And at that time, the crowds think it's thunder. Or they think that an angel is speaking to Jesus. They apparently don't want to or don't understand what's being said. But in all three instances, God the Father says, this is my son. Here, my chosen one at the baptism in whom I'm well pleased. This is my son. And then, I know, Peter, you want this to go forever. I know, Peter, you don't ever want this experience to end. I understand that. I mean, this is one of the most wonderful, glorious times maybe that you'll ever experience in your life. And guess what? It's never going to happen again. What are you supposed to do? Listen to Jesus. So his father says, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Akute, listen to him. As the cloud dissipated, Jesus came, according to Matthew 17, again, touched them and said, get up. And at that point, it's Jesus. Glory's gone. Back to normal. 
Jesus as they had known him before. Again, let me quote from the New American Commentary for a minute. The account centers on Jesus, not on Moses and Elijah, and not even on Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. The law and the prophets pointed to Jesus. He is the essence and the heart of God's revelation. Anything that detracts from Jesus alone, such as Peter's suggestion of the booths, loses sight of the fact that believers in the early church were called Christians because Jesus alone was the ground of their faith. Therefore, when anyone seeks to add something, making the Christian faith Jesus plus a basic misunderstanding of the Christian faith has occurred. It's about Jesus. We love to read Moses. We love to read the Exodus story. We love to read the prophets. Who doesn't want to hear about Elijah on the mountain with all those prophets of Baal and how they can't get God, their God, Baal, to send fire on the sacrifice, but Elijah could in a simple prayer. Who doesn't want to hear these stories? Who doesn't want to read these stories? But remember, all of this, in one way or another, is pointing to Jesus. The point of the Bible is Jesus. The point is we need Jesus for our salvation. Three disciples received their mountaintop experience. They only had this one time. But even then, as they come down the mountain, they can't share it. Well, think about it, how quickly people want to share their mountaintop experiences today. But they're, they're prohibited. In fact, we don't read it in our text, but over in Matthew, as they're coming down the mountain, Jesus tells them, don't share this until after the resurrection, until after the coming of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the people need a Savior of their sins before they need a Savior of nations. People need a Savior, a personal Savior, before they can even be qualified for the kingdom of God. Jesus needed to die on the cross so that he could offer us salvation. But he's coming again. And when he comes again, this picture we read about his transfiguration, that's the picture we read coming in the clouds in that day. The disciples had a chance to see it, and these three get to share it. Now, James doesn't live very long. You go back and you look in the book of Acts, and it's not long before Herod gets a hold of James and kills him. He's going to, he tries to go after Peter too, but God delivers Peter. But when you go and you read the book of John, 1 John, that's towards the end of your Bible, and 1 Peter, again, towards the end of your Bible, those two reflect on this experience as they speak of the glory of God. There's a purpose that Jesus had these three come up on the mountain with him. There was a purpose to encourage them. Like I said, they were about to experience a most devastating experience to see their Messiah, whom they thought would lead them to glory, die. A dead Messiah was not what they were looking for. But that's not the end of the story. Three days later, what did Jesus do? He rose from the dead. What happened a few days after that? He ascended to heaven. What happened a few days after that? The Holy Spirit came. The church was born. What's happening after that? Well, we're trying to reach souls to let people know, hey, you want to know Jesus. You want to know Jesus because he's coming back. He's coming. And when he gets here, you want to know him because he's coming again. Just like we see in this transfiguration, he's coming again. He's coming in glory. Praise the Lord. Don't you want him to come now? Don't you want him to come today? Come, Lord Jesus, as Apostle Paul says at the end of Corinthians. We want a mountaintop experience. Disciples receive a mountaintop experience. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we long for spiritual mountaintop experiences so that we can be encouraged. Because again, living out our lives as a disciple can sometimes have some struggles. Denying ourselves, taking up the cross. 
We don't have to do that. We've got to deal with this selfish problem. We need a want, desire, experiences with the Lord, experiences that we can receive in worship, experience in prayer, experiences. I don't know. I'd love to hear that Pastor Nathan is enjoying a nice mountaintop experience in a spiritual way. We long for it. And you know what? God is so good because sometimes he gives it to you, doesn't he? Sometimes he gives you an opportunity to be really close to him. Maybe it's at a time of prayer. Maybe you have, I hope you have daily devotions, daily time that you spend with the Lord, making the Lord a priority of your life. During those times, the Lord can really seem close, can really be an encouragement to you. We long for those times. We long for those times. But you know what? Those times, don't la- they don't last forever. <laughs> I mean, we got we to gotta go out, and sometimes we have to make a living, right? We got to go out and work. Sometimes, um, well, life can be hard. Can I encourage you this morning? Listen to the voice of God that we've heard in this text. What does he tell us to do? Instead of pressing for a mountaintop experience, let's listen to his word. Think about it. I wrote a book on this subject, by the way, if you're interested. Go to Amazon.com and look up my name and you'll see everything I've published. Sometimes, people in their religion make it all about getting good feelings and not about truth. For some people, they're always seeking that mountaintop experience. Why? Because they want to feel good. They want that spiritual high. It's not about truth. It's not about what God said. It, who, you know, if, if it's a hard stuff, if it's a stuff like take up your cross and follow me, I don't want to hear that. Tell me how to experience the good, holy feelings. Listen, my friends. That is one of the most corrupt methods of selfishness I know. Using religion, using Christianity for the selfish purpose of getting good feelings. There's something wrong with that. God said, this is my son, my chosen one. And then what he said? Listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to him. This is the word of God. Listen to him. We all have heard the old song, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. You want to be happy in Jesus? There's no other way but to trust and obey.